even if these changes in the brain occur due to lack of light exposure, that returning to a bright light environment can reverse those detrimental effects. Human OS. Learn. Master. Achieve. Welcome, everybody, to this episode of Human OS Radio. Today, I am pleased to welcome Antonio Nunez, who is the principal investigator at the Nunez Lab at Michigan State University. He also serves as the Associate Dean of Academic Affairs and Postdoctoral Training in the Graduate School. Dr. Nunez, welcome to Human OS. Thank you for having me. So we share in common both having gone to Florida State, so go Knowles. <laughs> That's right. So you've come out with this very interesting research study about how light affects the brain. We're going to talk about that today. But before we get into that, tell us a little bit about your background and how you became interested in light overall and how its effects on the body. Well, I got my PhD from Florida State University working with Fred Stefan, who was one of the discoverers of the location of the primary biological clock in the brain. And my dissertation with Fred related to how rhythms are synchronized to the LIDAR cycle and how information about circadian signals are distributed throughout the brain. So ever since graduate school, I've been interested in circadian rhythmicity and the effects of light on the circadian system. When I started my own lab here at Michigan State, I was working with traditional laboratory species, mice, rats, hamsters, and all of them are nocturnal. They are night active and therefore different from us, from humans. So it was not until my colleague, Loris Mayo, imported from Africa, wrote it that is related to mice and rats, but happens to be diurnal. And that has been the focus of a lot of my work for the last 15, 20 years or so. You must be excited to see the explosion and interest in circadian rhythms overall. You are definitely early to the game. Right. And it was very rewarding to see the Nobel Prize going to three of the pioneers in the field. Tell us more about what your lab has looked at over, let's say, just the last couple of years, since you've been working this for 15 years. So this work started with collaboration with Loris Mail and Lily Yan, who are both uh, colleagues of mine here at Michigan State. We focus a lot on the differential effects of light on behavior in diurnal and nocturnal species. Mm. What we found was that there's a remarkable, almost opposite effect of light on behavior, where if you turn on the lights, a diurnal species regardless of time of day, will wake up and be active. The same light presented to a nocturnal species like rats and mice will induce with short latency sleep. So that told us that if we want to understand how light affects humans, we had to focus on a diurnal mammal to answer questions about mechanisms. So that's the background for this particular paper. What are some of the neuroanatomical players that are involved in coordinating some of these signals? The original key projection, which was discovered in the 1970s, is a direct projection to the hypothalamus, to the supercharismatic nucleus, where the principal circadian oscillator in mammals resides. But now we know that projections from retinal ganglion cells that are not involved in visual perception per se, but they're involved in transduction of light information, project to a number number of regions in the brain that are not involved with vision, they're not involved with image formation, but they are responsible for more reflexive effects to, of light as well as for synchronizing biological clocks to the LIDAR cycle. So you can have an individual that is blind with respect to being able to form images, but if there's ganglion cells, cells in the retina that photoreceptive themselves have a substance called melanopsin, they can respond to light even though they don't consciously see light. So I'm looking at parts of the brain that our retinal recipient receive input from the retina but are not involved in seeing, they're not involved in visual perception. So all these effects of light on arousal, on activity, on sleep are mediated by those projections from the retina as well as the synchronous of circadian rhythms to the LIDAR cycle. 
You said something earlier that I'm going to repeat because it was so interesting. In diurnal rodents, like this type that you used from Africa, when they are exposed to light, it will wake them up no matter what time of day it is. Exactly. And conversely, if you're a nocturnal species and you're exposed to light, that signal makes them go to sleep and rather quickly. So light itself is not necessarily doing one thing, but it is having a strong response depending on whatever the nature of your awake timing is. Correct. Okay, so we've got a clear signal here. In your paper, you talk about how the effects of light on cognitive performance are well known in humans. Tell us more about the findings that led up to you generating a hypothesis and then protocol for the study. There is convincing evidence in the literature with humans, different populations, showing that different cognitive competencies are improved by exposing humans to bright light. And since most of the work with the effects of light in laboratories looking for mechanisms has been done with nocturnal species, there was this gap in our knowledge about mechanism. How is light affecting cognition in a diurnal species? And that's why we took advantage of this diurnal rodent to ask questions about mechanism. And the first thing we had to do was to show that in our animal model, in our diurnal rodent, the grass rat or arbicanthus, there was an actual effect of light intensity on cognitive functions. So our first task was exploratory, which was the work of one of our graduate students, Joel Soler. And what we asked Joel to do was to test animals that had been either dim light or bright light for four weeks on a task that depends upon an intact and functioning hippocampus, which is a part of the brain that is essential for normal human memory. It's also very important for navigation and spatial memory, recognizing the places you have visited, remembering where you park your car, if you park your car, jump on an airplane for a week and come back to the airport, things like that. So what he found was a remarkable effect of light illumination on the performance, the retention of this task that involves using a very common apparatus called the Morris Water Maze, where the animal needs to navigate in to find safe platform in an otherwise deep water environment. So what Joel found was that these animals that have been in dim light basically overnight, over a 24-hour period between days of training, would forget what they learned the day before and show a very poor performance as a function of time since learning the task. The animals that were in bright light show full retention, what you would expect from animals that are using their hippocampus to an optimal level. That was the first step, was to establish in our animal model an effect of light on cognitive performance. And the hypothesis that we had was that it was probably a change in the hippocampus, since that task depends upon the integrity of that part of the brain. So we focused on the hippocampus and we found two remarkable effects of four weeks in dim light. One was a chemical change. Hippocampus of the animals in dim light had significantly less of a substance called BDNF. It's a growth factor that is essential for plasticity and retention of acquired information in the hippocampus. So there was a measurable chemical change in the hippocampus in four weeks. It was not an immediate change. After a week in dim light, there was no change. So it had to be a more sustained exposure. But after four weeks, both the memory was deficient, the cognitive performance was challenged, and there was a reduction in this growth factor. So we took it one step further and look at the morphology of the neurons in the hippocampus. We have known for many years that the inputs to the hippocampus in the particular area that we looked at depend upon the presence of what are called dendritic spines, which are just extensions of the neurons that receive the information from other neurons. So they are the postsynaptic receiving end of these neurons. And we found a remarkable reduction in the number of dendritic spines in the hippocampus after four weeks in dim light. The reduction was statistically significant, but the effect was close to 30% reduction. So it was a big effect. Mm. that correlated with the reduction in growth factor production and correlated with the behavioral deficit. Our contribution here was to at least suggest a mechanism that is responsible for how bright lights or dim lights can differentially affect cognitive functions in diurnal species and by extension in humans as well. 
So you exposed these diurnal rats to dim light for a period of four weeks, and then you measured the amount of BDNF or this growth factor that was present in the brain. That correlated with a 30% reduction in the amount of hippocampal neurons, and that loss of hippocampal neurons, which are associated with memory formation, also paired with a reduced performance on this memory task, this water maze task. Correct. Rather, we didn't find a reduction in the number of neurons. We actually didn't count neurons. We count how many dendritic spines were present, and that's the 30% of reduction. Thank you for that clarification. That's useful. This is a bit scary because we are diurnal animals as well. We spend 90% of our time indoors, much different than how we used to live as humans prior to the modern age. Are there some hopeful signs here from your research too? The good news is that we took animals that had been in dim light for four weeks and we transferred them to bright light for another four weeks. So they were moved back to bright light after being exposed to four weeks of restricted light. And what we found was that everything returned to normal. The performance, the memory ability of the animals returned to normal. The production of BDNF returned to normal. And the number of dendritic spines that have been reduced in dim light returned to normal. So the good news is that even if these changes in the brain occur due to lack of light exposure, returning to a bright light environment can reverse those detrimental effects. The caveat here is that we use young adults. Right. These were relatively young animals. So one question that is there for future research is whether or not this ability to rebound mm-hmm. persists in aging organisms. Were you able to measure how quickly the neurons that had been exposed to the dim light condition were rescued by bright light exposure? Or you're just able to look at before and after? No, that's also for future research yeah. to see how quickly and whether or not there might be traits offs like what if it's one week of very intense bright lights all those are future parametric studies that should clarify the time course both in the decay and the rebound we know with respect to the decay that one week of exposure to dim lights doesn't do anything mm. so we know that much but we don't know if two would be enough or three we know that four can do it one dozen. And we know that four weeks of bright light after four weeks of dim light can reverse the effects. But we don't know if it happens sooner or it could be accelerated by increasing the light intensity or whether or not it interacts with the age of the organism. So all of those are really good questions for future studies. If you expose the diurnal animals to mostly dim light, but they did receive an hour of bright light per day in that dim light four week period, Is there some sort of Pareto principle where you get 80% of the effect of preservation of these healthy dendritic spines and if you just get enough per day? Right, that we don't know that. Another interesting manipulation. So give them like a pulse, a one hour of light at the end of the day or at the beginning of the day and see if that's enough to sustain normal functioning. Those are all good questions, but will take a lot of work to answer them. My mentor, Jamie Zeitzer at Stanford, he's doing the light pulses to shift circadian timing. But what I'm immediately thinking about now is the potential utility of wearing a device like that in an office. You put it on for 10 minutes a couple times a day just to get bright light exposure exposure through the flashes, could that actually help to preserve cognitive function and neural health? Or, or you can spend four weeks in, in Tallahassee or something. So Antonio, are you suggesting that employers should give their employees one week off to go to the beach every four weeks? It Absolutely. sounds like- <laughs> Especially during winter in Michigan, for sure. You are now my most popular podcast guest ever. <laughs> The next interesting question that you're going to look into is if orexin given to these rats during the dim light exposure has the ability to rescue and recover the neurons like the light exposure does. That suggestion, that hypothesis comes from my collaborator, Lily Yang. She has looked at orexin abundance in diurnal animals, exactly the same species that have been kept in dim light or bright light. And she sees a reliable reduction in orexin in animals that are in dim light. And there are two other things that are pertinent here. One, we talked at the beginning about how the key retinal projections that go to different parts of the brain involve in responses to light that are not associated with visual perception. We have a number of those areas and the hippocampus is not one of them. Mm -hmm. So we're seeing an effect of light on hippocampal structure and function. But we know in our species as well as in traditional nocturnal rodents that the retina doesn't project directly to the hippocampus. But there's 
retinal input to the orexin producing neurons. Orexin neurons project to a multitude of places, but one of them is the hippocampus. So Lily Gann's hypothesis, based on her observations of a reduced orexin abundance in dim light, is that orexin input to the hippocampus is the mediator of this effect of light. So you get dim light, reduced orexin input on the hippocampus, and therefore a change in BDNF production and dendritic spines. So the next step in her side of this research project is to take animals that are in dim light and through different approaches increase orexin production and see if that reverses the effects of dim light and in parallel look and see if blocking the effects of orexin in the hippocampus can diminish BDNF and enriched spines and impair behavior in animals that are in bright lights. Right. So that's Lily Gant's next experiment going on in her lab at this point. That'll really help to flesh out the mechanism. And for the listener, just to add a little bit more context, orexin is a neuropeptide that is produced in periforinical regions of the hypothalamus. These are the neurons that go missing when somebody develops the condition of narcolepsy. What's so interesting here is that that if we're not getting enough light during the day, we're getting input to these orexin-producing neurons when we get adequate light. And then that will facilitate BDNF growth factor in the hippocampus to keep our memory-forming neurons and dendritic spines healthy and functioning. And so this next work is going to look at this in multiple ways, pharmacological manipulation of orexin and also blocking orexin's effects to just challenge it from two different sides. That would help because one potential therapy, instead of having people get outside, because that can be difficult if you have a job at a desk, like most people do, would be a pharmacologically delivered orexin A intranasally or orally. So yeah, that could be a potential way to keep our brains healthy. And the intranasal avenue is really interesting. And Joel Soler, the guy who's doing who's working in this project, is doing a pilot just to see if that approach would work with our animals, to see if your peripheral administration through the nasal cavities could work in reversing the effects of dim light. Once again, I'm a big fan of the ancestral paradigm for health. So what were our lives like prior to modernity and all the invention, including buildings and air conditioning and jobs, all of these forces that actually get us to live in a way that is very normal now, but actually pretty unique and weird to our physiology. And there's another great example is just the amount of light that we receive during the day. And yet again, another important aspect of it, keeping our hippocampal memory forming neurons strong, as this work indicates by Dr. Nunez. So Dr. Nunez, thank you so much for coming on to the show, and I really appreciate your time and this contribution. It's uh, it's fascinating stuff. My pleasure. Thank you. Thanks for listening, and come visit us soon at humanos.me.